is thanks to the hundreds of hog farmers throughout the country that modern American markets are able to offer pork products with confidence and in ever-increasing quantities. On the satisfaction of the consumer rests the future of the hog farmer. In modern swine production, three factors determine success. Breeding, feeding, and management. Let's talk first about breeding. At our farm here in Waterloo, we select boar replacements two ways. Certification and swine evaluation station data. This boar is well muscled and has adequate scale. He was selected on breed certification information. To be from a certified litter, the animals must be from a litter of eight raised, which meet production registry standards. In certification, two litter mates are slaughtered. With these, there must be less than one and six tenths inches of back fat. Body length in excess of 29 inches and four square inches of loin eye muscle. This swine evaluation station is one of many across the country. Here in the most modern facilities, all breeds go on test at 60 pounds come off at 200 and are judged on their daily gain, feed efficiency, and carcass merit of their barrel brothers. They should weigh 230 pounds or more at 180 days. With a bore probe of less than 1.1 inches of back fat. This fellow has 0.83 inches. Daily gain is 1.97, and feed efficiency 2.78. His litter mates met certification standards. Boars should be well cared for in sturdily constructed houses, with both sides open to provide adequate ventilation in the summer. In winter, the sides should be dropped and good bedding provided. Now about the gills. These animals weigh 230 pounds at 180 days and have less than 1.35 back fat thickness. Have 12 good udder sections, are from a litter of eight or more raised, and have acceptable conformation. A gilt should not be bred until it is eight months of age, and during this time it should be fed a good growing ration. When the gilts are old enough, they mate on pasture, but many producers get good results on dry lot. During the gestation period, rations vary in different localities due to seasons and conditions. The gilts should be fed a ration prescribed by your state extension specialist or the feed manufacturer. Portable steel shelters provide shade in the summer and warm housing in the winter. Prior to farrowing, the sow ought to be thoroughly scrubbed with detergent and water and rinsed with a weak lindane solution to ensure a clean animal entering the farrowing house. To avoid contamination, everyone has to pass through a foot bath of disinfectant on entering or leaving the farrowing house. Lined with a non-porous material, our farrowing house is thoroughly clean and sanitized, top side and floor, and allowed to dry for two weeks before farrowing. Well insulated and ventilated, it is kept dry and warm during and after farrowing. The stalls are made of steel and set in concrete. With a front slope to prevent waste water from the drinking cup draining under the animals, and a rear slope to dispose of all the liquid waste. Steel guards on each side of the stall prevent the sow from crushing her litter, and a guard plate enables the pigs to move freely around the mother at all times. 
Clean, dry bedding on the floor of each pen adds comfort and protection for the new pigs. Room temperature should be thermostatically maintained at 65 degrees. However, a floor temperature of 75 degrees is best for baby pigs and can be achieved through the use of heat lamps above each litter. Shortly after birth, the navels are disinfected and the wolf teeth are blunted to avoid damage to the sow's udder during feeding. And ears are notched for positive identification. After four days, iron shots are given. To cut the work of feeding and cleaning, the sow should be let out of the farrowing stall for one or two hours, morning and evening. A good lactating ration should be provided in a self-feeder. This ration should be high in energy and properly balanced to stimulate maximum milk production. The baby pigs milk her out, lessening the danger of infection. These important management techniques properly used during farrowing will ensure strong, healthy, fast-doing pigs. And after approximately a week, the litter will be ready to move to a less elaborate facility. We take them to a nursery and growing area where they nurse for five or six weeks until they are weaned. Male pigs are best castrated during the second week. And at this time, the pigs should also be given a good creep starter ration and plenty of fresh water. During cold weather, supplemental heat ought to be provided for the first three weeks. Some successful producers, like the Hamilton brothers at Iowa Falls, vary the growing method, using different equipment and arrangements. They have combined farrowing and growing in this single unit. First, this stall prevents crushing of the pigs. Then, after 10 days or so, the bars are folded back to provide a creep area. Easy cleaning is built into this installation with a mechanical barn cleaner carrying all manure to the end of the building. A number of farmers will farrow twice a year, spring and fall. Others, to get the best use out of labor and equipment, farrow four times, December, February, June, and August. So far, we've looked at the farrowing and nursery stages in confinement. There is also the pasture system. Bernard Collins at Clarion, Iowa, prefers to move the sow and her litter out to a good legume pasture after five days. Portable hog houses provide the necessary shelter. Basic requirements of the pasture system should be clean ground, fenced hog tight, with adequate shade. Hogs raised in this manner have no anemia and present no manure handling problems. Farrowing during the summer in these same portable shades has also proved successful here. This thousand gallon water tank serves four separate sow pastures. while this line feeder handles two pastures. In each of these systems, the producers have raised a healthy 40-pound pig through the use of sound management principles. Now, in the last stage of the life cycle, our pigs are moved to the specially designed finishing house. Here the concrete floor has a half inch to the foot slope to the front. A gutter or slab catches all the liquids and solid manure with no drainage through the pins. Gates should have at least one and a half inches of clearance off the concrete to provide free flow of manure and water. Fifty pigs of approximately the same weight are put into each pin. Hinged sides form a tight wall in the winter and permit good ventilation and shade in the summer. For 
additional summer comfort, this fogging device is used when the temperature reaches 80 degrees or more. Adequate space in the finishing house is vital. Pigs between 40 and 120 pounds should be allowed nine square feet each. From 120 pounds to market weight, 12 square feet should be given each animal. Because they are round, these self-feeders accommodate a full quota of animals. We figure one foot of feeder space to every four pigs. Sturdily built of corrosion-resistant, heavy-gauge steel, they withstand the rough treatment of growing and finishing hogs. They save labor and are adjustable to prevent feed waste and are easily filled directly from the feed dealer's bulk truck. In winter, the drinking water should be kept at 40 degrees. And to prevent drain back, watering cups are raised four inches off the concrete. This solves most freezing problems. If a pressure system is used, there should be one foot of water space allowed for every 50 pigs. With a gravity flow system, this should be increased. Water should be flushed several times a week. Manure is removed two or three times per week. In some confinement feeding operations, the manure goes to a lagoon where the bacteria break the manure down. Lagoons should always be fenced in for complete safety. Others collect this waste in a pit before it's hauled away in a liquid form. There are some other finishing operations I have seen which are well worth mentioning. The Francis Clark Farm at Frankfort, Indiana is a good example of a completely automated swine finishing operation. Feed is automatically mixed and augered. Water is under pressure. Manure is mechanically removed. At the Clarence King Farm near Owine, Iowa, they farrow in this farrowing house and move the pigs to the field after weaning. They finish their hogs on legume pasture using portable steel shelters. Here the feeders are easily filled from a self-unloading wagon. In this operation, water is piped to the hogs in the field. In pasture operations, wallows provide summer comfort. Steel wallows are durable, easily moved, and easily drained. In some areas, hogs glean cornfields after harvest and follow cattle. 60% of a farmer's corn harvesting losses can be recovered by letting hogs and cattle glean the cornfields. These hogs have been sorted and weigh 200 to 220 pounds. They should be loaded carefully to prevent bruises and death loss and move quickly to a market or packing plant. By showing you some of the operations of other successful producers, we've tried to highlight for you the modern trends in swine production. The job you do in breeding, farrowing, feeding, and management is reflected in the tonnage and quality of pork you market. Okay, we're